This is about what Ron Wyatt claimed to discover. And he claimed to discover many things. If you're familiar with him, uh, you, you know that he's made some pretty big claims. And if you're not familiar with him, this might be a bit of a shock for you because some of the things that he's found should be known in the entire world of Christianity. Some of the things that he's found has been verified, verified by multiple witnesses, yet they're not talked about. I think the reason they're not discussed in the Christian circle and in Christian churches is number one, we live in a Laodicean dead church age. It's lukewarm. It doesn't care about the Bible or God. Number two, I think one of the issues is, is that he is a Seventh-day Adventist, and that scares people away from bringing him up. That scares away pastors and teachers from even mentioning his name because he's a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, I don't give a rip if he's a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm going to look at what he actually found, and I'm going to look at if he actually found it or not. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. The first discovery we can investigate is the location of Gomorrah. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld. And lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Ron Wyatt claimed to rediscover the ruins of ancient Gomorrah, the actual place where God rained down fire from the sky. And to begin showing you the evidence of this, I want to introduce you to Lotan from KJV Pictures, who has actually been to the place where Ron Wyatt claimed was Gomorrah. Hey everyone, Lotan here from KJV Pictures. I'm super excited to make this video because when Brother Brandon told me he was making this study, I had a few things to add. You see, Ron Wyatt's videos were some of the first videos I saw as a newborn Christian. And having family in Israel myself, I decided to go check out some of his findings firsthand. One finding in particular, because if true, for me, it would be sort of a smoking gun discovery. And that was the location of Sodom and Gomorrah. Ron had claimed to discover this location in, I believe, 1990, and his discoveries were quite shocking. Architecture, brimstone, sulfur balls, the whole nine yards. But no one in the Christian community seemed to ever talk about it. I don't know, I had to check it out for myself. So I went on his website, and using only this map, I made my way to the supposed location of Gomorrah. As you can see, I wasn't working with a whole lot. Uh, the road we took to the Dead Sea spit us out right around here, and then we traveled up the coast until I eyed a piece of white, ash-colored land where the map suggested Gomorrah would be. There was no parking lot or anything, no tourists, or anyone for that matter, just a two-way road up and down the coast of the Dead Sea. So we pulled the car over and just started walking. Right away, a large ziggurat-type structure greeted us. Hey, look, it's me. You can see from the picture that this is still the entrance of the city because you can still see desert plants. And we know from Deuteronomy that no grass or seed will ever take root there. Well, sure enough, as we entered the city, hey look, that's me again. No grass or plants made their home there. You could see straight lines in the walls of the city where houses or other architecture used to be. And you could even see more ziggurat type structures at major intersections. Although I didn't notice it firsthand on my trip since we only had about a few hours to explore and you'd probably need about a few days from what I saw. Uh, but when I looked at this photo, I noticed in the background other symmetrical type structures off in the distance. And nature just doesn't do that type of thing. All the walls of the valleys were decorated with this swirl-like pattern. It was beautiful to look at like heat had melted different layers of rock and stone together. But beautiful as it was, it was just dust and ash to the touch. All these structures and ashen remains were great and all, but I still didn't have that smoking gun evidence that I wanted. I needed more evidence. I needed to find the sulfur balls that Ron claimed to be scattered all about. That would be my smoking gun. Only then would I be convinced that this was, in fact, the remains of that sinful city that God poured his judgment on thousands of years ago. 
Sure enough, I found more than a dozen small balls of sulfur scattered about. This is what's left of my personal collection today. I've burned some to show friends and family, and the smell is, well, horrifying. I can only imagine what it must have been like when these balls in their pure form came raining down from heaven on those lost cities. Yet, if you ask me, I'd say Ron found it. But ultimately, it's up to you if you want to believe him or not. But I think the real question is, do his discoveries contradict scripture? Because if they contradict scripture, I don't. it doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what you believe. But if they don't, well... For that, I'll turn the study back over to Brother Brandon. Brandon, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I look forward to listening to the rest of the study. Thank you, Lotan, and I highly recommend that you go subscribe to KJV Pictures because his content is on point, King James only. And everything he does is really well done, not only from a production standpoint, but from a scriptural basis. Now, I know what Lotan has showed you is very interesting if you've never seen it before but i want to establish this with more witnesses so you can really see that this is not just lotan there are many people who have verified what ron wyatt claimed to find that's a good sized one still going That's sulfur. That'll burn right now. Just put a lighter to it and it'll burn till it's gone. Pretty neat stuff. <laughs> We're gonna set it on fire so um, everybody can see it burn. See it turning yellow and it starts melting, turning black. Watch, and it's, it's burning. still burning. And pretty soon it'll start running down the wall. <laughs> Away from the Dead Sea, it is still possible to find today the remains and ruins of the destroyed cities described in Genesis 19. Although the locals consider these remains to be sand dunes due to 3,500 years of rain erosion, Archaeologists like Ron Wyatt and Jake Wilson have discovered evident man-made structures in the area in the 1990s. Formations such as ancient houses, gates, temples, statues can still be spotted in the area. As opposed to regular sulfur, this pale white form of sulfur can only be found in the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah. It cannot be found in any volcanic area or any mineral museum. Supporting the Genesis account, geothermal activity has never been recorded in the region, so these brimstones could not have come from a volcanic eruption. Just one touch. I didn't even see the sulfur on my finger. Look at this blister. It was so hot, it was indescribable. This is absolutely staggering. Uh, we've traveled the Holy Land. Uh, these are the believed sites of Sodom and Gomorrah. There is some discrepancy as to where they might be, but the evidence is so overwhelming that right here, this is where Sodom and Gomorrah is. I have been absolutely impacted and impressed by this. It's just, I mean, right now I just feel 
just a sense of, of awe over me right now as we're here. And as they have discovered in these areas a brimstone, and they're like balls. And this brimstone is totally different than any other place on the planet. Most other brimstone, and I should mention brimstone is synonymous with sulfur. So brimstone is kind of the old word for sulfur. So we have found sulfur balls all over in these city areas here. And it's unlike any other sulfur on the planet, as I mentioned. They're white and they are about 90 to almost 100% pure. This brimstone is made of monoclinic, white sulfur that has been burned or cooked at a high temperature. It is quite different from natural sulfur that is formed in geothermal areas. Samples were taken to a lab for analysis. Each specimen was carefully separated and prepared for testing, with the outer portion cast aside. Next, the samples were dried and placed in a rock crusher. Then they were pressed onto a disc. Then they were loaded into a machine for the semi-quantitative X-ray analysis. Each sample was individually transported into the testing chamber for analysis. The results proved to be quite amazing. as the samples were found to be 98% pure sulfur, unlike any other sulfur found on Earth. This pure, cooked sulfur is the heavenly marker that was left behind to show the world that the Lord, without a doubt, destroyed these sinful cities at His command. Critics have said that the sulfur is from volcanic activity, but that type of rhombic sulfur is only 40% sulfur and is of a crystalline form, unlike the white, compacted monoclinic form that is found in the ashen cities today. Here is a round piece of brimstone embedded in a section of ash. Another clump of ash contains a piece of brimstone that has a burn ring surrounding the unburned sulfur inside. Considering the Bible describes this as being once like an Edenic area. You see nowadays it's just completely dead. As we are told, happened to this place that was judged. Today it's completely dead. Nothing is growing here. thing is like sponge and I really want to find one of those sulfur stones before I before the sun goes down I really want to find one of those stones to show you that is not a normal shape that doesn't look natural at all <laughs> that is definitely seems to be a man-made shape and is this not enough evidence for people to, to find all of these man-made looking structures, ashen remains, crumble in your hands, in the location where we're told in the Bible as, a, as evidence of God's judgment, as uh, described by Josephus, historian, but then also finding circular, almost pure sulfur balls in the middle of the ash in the middle of the walls and the shapes of the buildings. Is this not enough evidence for us to, to see that A, the Bible is true, and B, God is a just God and we need a saviour? Because sin requires punishment. Sin is, it brings on the wrath of God and this place is the evidence of the wrath, the wrath of God, a holy God who is righteous and true, and this place was very rebellious. Now, whether or not you've heard of this discovery before, I want you to think about the fact that nobody talks about this. Why is this information so suppressed? Something that Lotan said that 
that resonates with me is there was nobody there. There was not even a tourist attraction or anything. Dude, if the LGBT community knew, if this was widespread information, and if everybody knew that Sodom and Gomorrah was real and God actually wiped out the city, why do archaeologists not look into this? What are they looking at? If they're not looking at this, where it's directly in your face, what are they actually spending their time on? Lotan said there's nobody there. Dude, this thing has been discovered for since 1990. That's, that's 31 years ago. Come on. There's no archaeologists in Sodom and Gomorrah with all this video evidence after 31 years. That's the world we live in. The truth is suppressed. Every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So the world won't share it. The Christians won't share it because when they point it back to Ron Wyatt, they'll say, oh, Seventh-day Adventists will we'll get everybody entangled into this false doctrine of Seventh-day Adventism. So the Christians don't share it, the world doesn't share it, and it just sits there. If you're interested in watching any of those videos that I just gave you a sample of in full length, I'll put the links in the video description of this video. Feel free to research those and watch those in your own time. They're all really, really good. Uh, some of those documentaries are very informative. And keep in mind, as you watch all these, that none of these documentaries would even exist if God did not use this one man to bring them to light. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. If you open your Bible to the very back where you have all of your maps, you're going to see that most Bibles at least have a path drawn out of the Exodus pathway from when the Israelites left Egypt from slavery when they were delivered by God through the Red Sea and then all the way to Mount Sinai and through the wilderness, most Bibles will have a map that depict the pathway and the route that they took. Uh, you can throw that map in the trash. That's not the actual route. Ron White found the actual Red Sea crossing. When Ron Wyatt was at this spot in 1978, he decided to inspect the waters here for any evidence that may have been left behind from approximately 20,000 chariots, plus the horses, horsemen, and foot soldiers. What he found has been confirmed by others. Uh, scientists always kept trying to say that they crossed in the Sea of Reeds, which was ankle deep at a certain time of year and stuff. And dad wanted to prove that it was a miracle. biblical miracle. Mm -hmm. And so he tried to trace their steps from Egypt. And basically he did. He got an airplane and he had this guy named Moses, actually. Yep. This is no lie. <laughs> we hired a pilot in Elot and his name was Moses. And he flew us up and down through there and Dad told him what we we're looking for. We're looking for a valley that goes all the way through the mountains from here from the Sinai Peninsula to here. And the guy said, oh yeah, there is one. And back then there wasn't a road even down it, no. but now they have a road down there. All the way through. Yeah. It keeps yeah. washing out all the time. There has never been any real convincing evidence, nothing found, nor archeological evidence found by Cairo, Egypt that would support the fact that the Israelites crossed there. 
There has been, however, much evidence found, archaeological evidence, to show that the crossing was here and that Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. So basically what we have here is the traditional Exodus route from Goshen, where the Israelites were in Egypt. They came out of Goshen, and then they crossed over uh, around here somewhere, and this is where the traditional crossing of the Red Sea is. It's really sad because they're basically saying that Egypt's chariots got drowned in this really sh shallow marsh-like area. They will keep the traditional site of Mount Sinai, and they'll put it here, not because of evidence they found, but because Constantine's mother said this was Mount Sinai. So the scholars, with all their wisdom, go along with Constantine's mother, and in order to do that, they got to put the Red Sea crossing over here, because it wouldn't make sense over there. And they also say that this is the real Red Sea crossing because in the Hebrew, it's the, the Sea of Reeds, the Reed Sea. But if you actually look into it in other places in the Bible, it describes this area right here as the Red Sea as well. So this is also the Red Sea in the Bible. So anyways, the actual Red Sea crossing, they ended up at this beach right here. And then they crossed right here. So the actual Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Uh, according to scholars, it's where Constantine's mother said it was. But according to Paul, the apostle, it's in Arabia. And that's where it actually is, and we'll look at that next. But here's where the actual Red Sea crossing is. The actual route starts here, goes down through here, and then they get entangled in the wilderness. And let me see if I have a map of that. Yeah, so as you can see, there's like this windy valley. And that's where Pharaoh realized they would be entangled in the wilderness. And then went pursued them. And they came out at the beach here. And this is where they actually crossed. There's another bird's eye view of the beach. And as you can see, all of Israel would fit onto this area of land. While God protected them with a pillar of fire, cutting off Pharaoh's army coming from behind. They're literally finding chariot wheels. This is all found in that Red Sea area. Egyptian chariots were known to use metal hubs in the center of the wheels. Using metal detectors, divers have found metal in the raised hubs that are now covered in coral. So um, when you dive with metal underwater metal detector, you can uh, go over all the corals and you don't get any reading. And then when you go over um, obviously metal or iron or whatever, you do get a reading. So that's the way you know that if you've got a wheel shape and you get a metal, a strong metal reading from it, then uh, uh, that would be the difference between a round, just a round coral and something that could potentially be a chariot wheel. So when you um, compare this particular um, force boat hub to the hubs that you see in the Egyptian Museum, um, you know, it looks exactly the same, and there's metal where you'd expect to see it. Here we see another four-spoked chariot wheel with one spoke missing, and a center-raised hub. The coral here has preserved the chariot parts by retaining the man-made structure, even after the wood has disappeared. Here we see another wheel suspended on its axle, standing at attention. It has six spokes and a raised center hub. Ron Wyatt made many dives here and located many artifacts. That thing in the middle is like the hub of the wheel, and then it's almost like a cross of coral. The wood rotted away. The metal would still be there with coral around it. But as you can see, I mean, that's just not a natural coral formation. There shouldn't be any coral at all in this area, because there's nothing for it to grow on. But if there was a bunch of chariots down there rotting away, coral would definitely be growing on them. So, as you can see, I mean, that's clearly a chariot wheel. This is pretty clearly a chariot wheel. On the right side is giving you like an illustration, but I mean, you can even without the illustration, you can see. I mean, it just gets more and more obvious. Like, what is that coral doing? That's obviously something sticking out, like an axle. That's just not normal. I mean, come on. Like, what do you think that is? There's also a gold one found. And I mean, if you don't think that's a chariot wheel, I don't know what to tell you. That's a chariot wheel. 
The premier find here at the crossing site is this gold veneer that was left behind from a four-spoke chariot wheel. The Bible tells us there were 600 choice chariots used in the chase of the children of Israel. This artifact was left behind at a depth of 200 feet. Since specialized equipment would be necessary to raise it to the surface, today it is still in the location where it was found. Because when Dad first did the cameras, yeah. I don't think we even had the scuba gear no, yet, we did didn't. we? I think we were just No, our first out trip, first we didn't time. really find anything. Except we found the spot where we thought that it was. was but when we actually was. did go scuba diving, Dad bought two little underwater Kodak cameras. And that's what the underwater pictures were taken with. I took a picture of three different wheels. The golden chariot wheel picture got drowned in one of the cameras. And the other camera had a bunch of chariot wheels, but not the gold one. Me and Ronnie went down and touched. The, we touched uh, the gold chariot the wheel. Yeah. How deep was that? Somewhere around 180 feet. Yeah, it was right around there. Like Ronnie said earlier, we we're, you know, we were swimming about 30, 35 feet where you can stay all day, whatever, 32 feet. So but we were up we there swimming around, and if we saw anything, we'd go down. On a number of trips, we brought metal detectors to Nueva. And these reveal that inside the coral, there is metal that will be consistent with what we'd expect from finding remains of the Egyptian army. Now, some people have asked, well, if that's the case, why don't you just bring up artifacts, some of this coral that contains this metal? There's a very simple reason for that. As you can see on this sign, it's strictly forbidden to touch or remove any coral in the Red Sea. So for us to do so would be violating Egyptian law. Further south in the Gulf of Aqaba, you can see that things have been washed up on the land, like sea stars, corals, and other things twisted into one another, like a disastrous whatever, uh, like a washing machine has been uh, treating the material, so to speak. And also in that kind of material, we can find bronze. And bronze is a metal that's made by humans. So it's not a natural one. You can see how rugged these mountains are. And much of the Gulf of Aqaba is just as rugged underwater. So if God had parted the water with the underground terrain looking like this, it would have been impassable. There are 2,000 meter high mountains around the Gulf of Aqaba. There are 2,000 meter deep waters in the deepest section. Huge falls from the peaks to the bottom. You can ask the question, how can we cross the seabed? I mean, we just take away the water. We don't talk about the water. But how can you just cross? First, you could not have any mud on the seabed. You need a solid ground. Horses, horses should be able, full speed, going across that material, whatever the material is. In the middle of the, the Gulf of Aqaba, there is a shallow section, relatively speaking, shallow. And the interesting thing is that the downhill slope and then the uphill slope on the other side is within the criteria for wheelchairs in the U.S. <laughs> you know, it can't be too much uphill or downhill with a, with a wheelchair because it's too much work, so to speak. So the downhill slope and the uphill slope is within these limits. That's a scientific statement. This is the Wadi Watiya. This is the canyon that connects the Sinai Desert to the Red Sea. And you can see these very rugged mountains. If you're walking down this canyon, you've got to follow it all the way. You can't go left or right. We find in Exodus chapter 14, verse 3, a description where Pharaoh would say, the children of Israel are entangled in the land the wilderness has shut them in. That's a perfect description of this wadi leading down to the Red Sea.
Finally, after walking about 30 kilometers through this wadi, they come to the Red Sea. You can see behind us the Gulf of Aqaba and behind that, the mountains of Midian. Josephus described the mountains around the Red Sea crossing site as impassable by reason of their roughness. You can see these mountains here around Nueva Beach are extremely rough. You can see the loose rock, the shingle, very hard to climb and very dry and barren. Had the Egyptians attacked the Hebrews at the Red Sea crossing site and they'd scattered through these mountains, it would have been an absolute disaster for the Israelites. The interesting thing is that the, the gravel at the location in the midsection of the Gulf of Aqaba, since it's shallow there, the tidal current goes back and forth and keep this clean. And immediately when you take away the water, it's like concrete. It's very, very solid. So no problem with the horses, no problem with the chariots, yeah. no problems with the oxen and the, the oxen chariots and so forth. Just good. Across. Since there are chariot parts on this side of the Red Sea crossing, could there be other chariot parts on the other side of the Gulf, showing a continuation of artifacts? On the shore opposite of Nueva, inspection of the seafloor in Saudi Arabia has also been conducted to see if chariot parts can be found on this side of the Red Sea crossing. While investigating the Saudi Arabian waters, Vivica Pontian found this beautiful round chariot wheel specimen with a raised center hub. This is confirmation of the chariot parts continuing to the other side of the crossing site, opposite Nueva. They also found a human femur bone, uh, possibly a human rib cage, which is really hard to see, and a horse hoof. Horses are not on the Sinai Peninsula today. So, okay then, where did that come from? Why is that in the, the Red Sea crossing? So I think there's enough evidence here to easily conclude that this is the actual Red Sea Crossing. Uh, and as we'll see in a moment here, this is definitely the Red Sea Crossing because Mount Sinai is on the other side of it. and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount. At that time I had vacation to come to Korea. When I see my father, he said, look, look, I have been to Pilgrim, but the why is very big different, the Bible and Sinai Mount. And then I say, you are the elder in the church, how you say like that, <laughs> don't talk like this. He said, no, no, it's something different. And then he gave to me the videotapes. And then when I see this showing about Ron Wyatt, he said he had been to the northern part of the Saudi Arabia in Midian wilderness. Then he said Mount Sinai is there. So I was very much strange because since I was a child, I read so many times the books. But I'm just reading the book, but uh, never match on the map with the Bible. You know? The tradition that the mountain in Egypt's Sinai Peninsula is Mount Sinai only dates back to the 4th century AD. New research based on Jewish, Christian, and Islamic sources indicate that there is a tradition that is 600 years older. And according to that tradition, Mount Sinai is in northwest Saudi Arabia. This other tradition points to Jabal Makla, a peak on the mountain range known as Jebel al Laws, as the true mountain of Moses. Several historical sources, including Josephus, recorded that Mount Sinai is the highest mountain near a city that is today called Al-Bad. 
locals refer to Jabal Makla as Jebel Musa, the mountain of Moses. So you call this one, you call this one Jabal Musa? Jabal Musa. One of the distinguishing features of this mountain is the blackened top that you can see right behind me. The Bible says that God descended upon Mount Sinai as a fire. The blackened peaks stick out from the surrounding areas and the rocks are only black from the outside. Researchers disagree as to whether the blackened rocks are actual evidence of God descending upon the mountain as a fire like the Bible says, or whether it's natural volcanic rock. A small handful of Americans tried to sneak into this area in the late 1970s and the 1980s. They were arrested, and their photos and videos were confiscated by the Saudi police. Their evidence was lost. Mount Sinai was first discovered in 1984 by Ron Wyatt and his sons, who walked across the border into Saudi Arabia without a visa in order to document the evidence here. After seeing the mountain, he and his sons were captured and were accused of espionage. They spent 78 days in prison, awaiting execution before they were finally released. After Ron Wyatt was there, the Saudi government, they know that this place is important. And also they have a special investigation all around the mountains. They found so many stone structures and the many ancient the rock inscriptions. The local peoples, they call it the Jabal Lodz. Jabal Lodz, Jabal means Arabic is the mountains. Lodz means the almond. It's something strange, Arabic and Hebrew name is the same, Lodz. But in Saudi Arabia, actually it's not growing the almond tree except these mountains. God ordered to Moses, the Oholiab and Basalel, two persons giving them the knowledge mm -hmm. to make menorah yes. by the God. Mm -hmm. How they made menorah? Three branch and other side three branch yes. is like almond flour. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, three bowls made like unto almonds with a knop and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, with a knop and a flower, so in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. Then twelve tribes had problems that times. Moses ordered to the, every tribe, to the staff, to put the name of the tribe, and, put and then they put in the ark. Uh -huh. Morning times, found out the Aaron, his staff, yes. almond tree and almond flower was there. And take of every one of them a rod, Write thou every man's name upon his rod, and thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony, where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. How to match the, this mountain name and this almond? But also, why is matching the Jabal Lowe's and the Hebrew and Arab is the same word, same meaning? Well, we've made it not to the summit yet. We're at about 6,400 feet in the elevation. As you look behind me, you can see the big plain that the Israelites uh, camped in front of the mountain. And just right down where we're standing, you can see the plateau where definitely 70 plus people could have sat and ate with God. Remember, Moses went up there with the elders of Israel. And um, right in front of me is the Black Peak. We're going to summit that today. I understand from their video, they said where the, the black begins, it's very distinct. It's a clear change from normal rock to black. Like it's a boundary, a very really clear boundary. Did you found that too? Yeah, yeah. I go to the, on the back side that I, I come to there. But this one, the, like stone, is melted. But uh, some of them, they arguing, said, oh, this one volcanic stone. But volcanic stone, if you broke inside, also is black. Yes. But this one, only the outside is blackened. 20 to 30 percent from the top of the mountain is blackened. But it's the, it's go down, it's normal. Wow. Yeah, it's not like a volcanic stone. Right. Different, very big different volcanic stone. Okay, we are at the line where the stone changes color between the black stone and the white pink um, whatever you want to call it granite and here's the blackened boulder 
and we're just um, looking at it and we if you pull off this piece inside it's a different color that's kind of a pinkish but the outside is black now the amount of evidence around Mount Sinai here which today is called Jabal Makla reveals this place is indeed the true Mount Sinai it is all quite convincing, so let's now look at all of the evidence here at this Mount Sinai, which is known again as Jabal Makla. First of all, the Bible states that the Israelites camped at the base of Mount Sinai for around a year. Interestingly, at the base of this mountain here is a large flat area where the Israelites could have camped. It is huge in size and had streams of water and pasture land for their livestock to graze. Also, the climate was perfect as it is higher in elevation, so it's not hot in the summer and it's comfortable in the winter. Next, Exodus 19.18 states that Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. The top of these mountains are dark, showing signs of burnt marks. The outer parts of the rocks are black, but on the inside, they are brownish in color. And you can see here, there's been some rocks that have been chipped away, and you can see that on the outside, they're black, and on the inside, they are brown. This seems to be more evidence that this mountain and the surrounding mountains close by were covered with fire and smoke. Now from Mount Sinai, God gave the Ten Commandments to the nation of Israel and supernaturally wrote them on tablets of stone with his own finger. This was an earth shattering event. Scripture says the mountain was on fire for six days and appeared as if it was going to be consumed. And the Israelites who saw this were terrified as they beheld everything that took place. The Bible also speaks about how Moses and 70 elders of Israel went up the mountain to worship God. The elders were to stay at a distance from Moses and could only go part way up. Interestingly, there is a natural plateau part way up the mountain where this event could have happened. Another piece of strong evidence is that at the base of this mountain, an altar has been discovered. This would match what Scripture states in Exodus 24, 4 and 5. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he got up early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 memorial stones for the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the tribes of Israel and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Now at the very base of this mountain are extensive remains of an altar and a complete system for animal sacrifice. There are corrals where the animals would have been kept and an altar at the front of it. There have also been discovered animal bones here underground. Scripture also refers to 12 memorial stones or pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. Interestingly, there are stones by this altar that perfectly match the biblical record. The Saudi locals say that in the past, these stones were much more evident and could be seen much more clear, and that the platform was more intact as well. Also, Ron Wyatt documents having found one of the pillars that had Hebrew writings on it. It's quite fascinating that everything here matches perfectly the biblical account of this event. Near the altar of Moses and the 12 pillars, Moses read to the Israelites the Book of the Covenant and they agreed to it. This means that Moses probably had a spot right above the altar that served as a stage to address the Israelites. Now just above the altar of Moses is a large platform from where Moses could have easily spoken to the Israelites when the covenant was made. It provides a natural place from which to speak and the Saudi locals talk about how sound travels here like a natural amphitheater. 
Another fascinating discovery at the base of this mountain is the altar upon which Aaron set the golden calf and all Israel worshiped before it. On the top of these rocks is the main rock that shows a flat spot where the golden calf might have been placed for all Israel to see. Below the rocks is where Aaron would have made an altar to this golden calf. Now Exodus 32 provides all the details. It says, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a golden calf or a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. So Moses was on top of Mount Sinai for 40 days, and this event happened while Moses was away. Now interestingly, this golden calf was a representation of the Egyptian false god Hathor. It was one of Egypt's main gods. You can see images of this false god that look very similar to the paintings on these rocks here. There are also many other inscriptions on these rocks as well. Now worship of this false god Hathor consisted of dancing, drums, and sexual promiscuity. And this is exactly what the Israelites were doing while Moses was away. This altar, interestingly, is fenced and gated like other archaeological sites at the base of this mountain by the Saudi government. However, over the past several years, the Saudi government has opened up these sites to tourists and you can now go there easily and see these places for yourself. Additionally, many artifacts and discoveries have been found in this area that give great evidence that this mountain is indeed the true Mount Sinai. Now after the golden calf incident, when Moses returns back to the base of the mountain, it says in Exodus 32:20 what Moses did with this golden calf. It says, Then he took the calf which they had made and completely burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. At the base of this mountain there is a stream which forms a small lake. So this place provides the water that would have been necessary for this event to have happened here. There are also around this small lake a number of wells that have been discovered as well. So this area was a main water source. A stream came down from the mountain here and it was a main water source. There was another stream as well just to the north. So there was plenty of water in this area for these events to take place and for the nation of Israel to have used during their time at the base of Mount Sinai. Also, after the golden calf ordeal, God ordered the Levites to kill those who had been involved in the worship of the golden calf. In Exodus 32, 28, we see that 3,000 died as a result. Now with this being the case, there should be a mass graveyard site close by to this area. Interestingly, we find a site about four to five miles north that fits exactly this biblical event. There are thousands of standing stones that appear to have been used as grave markers in this flat plain. This area is also fenced off by the Saudi government and declared as an archaeological site. Also, close by to this mountain, there has been found a menorah painting which gives evidence that the Israelites were in this area. What I know, the oldest menorah was AD 70, Roman Titus, oh, yes. he took to the Rome, you know. After that, they don't found the oldest menorah up to today. But what I found, this menorah inscriptions is very old. Why? Around this menorah inscriptions, there is so many old letter was there. This old letter is very similar to Hebrew letters. Okay. 
and call it maybe Talmudic. Talmudic, it means BC 13 to B, B, BC 15. Okay. It's almost Exodus times. Wow. This letter with menorah together here. Okay. So let me tell you, the, that place is uh, Arabia. Uh -huh. That place, why there is the Jewish mark on it there? <laughs> and that place, why all the Hebrew letter is there? Unfortunately, this painting has been chiseled away in recent years, but older photos and documentation clearly prove its existence, and even what has been chiseled away shows the outline of a menorah. We also know that God gave to Moses, while they were at the base of Mount Sinai for about a year here, the design of the tabernacle, and that it was erected at the base of the mountain. Now, we don't have any evidence of this tabernacle as being here, as it was mobile in nature. However, by taking into consideration the location of the mountain and the lay of the land, there is a place here that would be the natural location for it to be. It is flat, close by to the altar of Moses, and at the base of the mountain. Now the Bible mentions how the prophet Elijah traveled to Mount Sinai and stayed in a cave there after his powerful confrontation with the 850 false prophets of Baal and Asherah on Mount Carmel as found in 1 Kings 19. At this confrontation, supernatural fire came down from the Lord and consumed the altar and everything on it. Then Elijah traveled to Mount Sinai and stayed in a cave. At this cave on Mount Sinai, God spoke to Elijah and strengthened him. Interestingly, on the side of this believed Mount Sinai is a large cave that perfectly matches scripture and where Elijah could have stayed. This cave is known as the Cave of Elijah. It is also the only large cave in this area of mountains. There are also many other evidences that can be found around Mount Sinai that support it as the true location of Mount Sinai. Now it says in Exodus 15, it says, Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy date palms, and they camped there beside the waters. And you can see in this video, this place has been found, this very place that it talks about has been found and it supports the biblical text. To this day, there are many palm trees and exactly twelve wells here. This would have provided water and met all the needs of the Israelites. Here you can see this area with the palm trees and some of the wells. The Saudi locals in the area point out that this is Elam and has been known by this name as long as they can remember. After this, it says in Exodus 17, then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And here is where Moses struck the rock, and water gushed out and came out from this rock. Now this rock that Moses struck and God split in two is believed to have been found and is a perfect match with the biblical account. It is massive in size and sits upon a small hill. It's also located in a large valley where the Israelites could have camped and can be seen from a long distance away. It shows water grooves in it where massive amounts of water ran down from it. And you can see this rock and the water channels and grooves that were made when the water gushed out from it. Now God confirms this in Isaiah 28, 21. It says, They did not thirst when He led them through the deserts. He made the water flow out of the rock for them. He split the rock and the water gushed out. And this is exactly what we see here at this large massive rock at Rephidim. And then it says in Psalm 78, it says, He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them abundant drink like the ocean depths. He brought forth streams also from the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. 
Now this rock from which the water flowed here at Rephidim is also referred to as the rock of Horeb because it is close by to Mount Sinai, also known as Mount Horeb. Also, while at Rephidim, the Amalekites came and fought against the Israelites. Exodus 17.8 says that, Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. The Amalekites were descendants of Esau and were a people who lived south of the Dead Sea region. God supernaturally gave the Israelites victory as Moses held up his arms. When his arms got tired from being outstretched, then Aaron and Hur helped him hold up his arms. And by doing so, the Israelites were victorious over the Amalekites. Also, right by this massive rock at Rephidim, you can see what appears to be an altar that Moses erected after defeating the Amalekites and named it Jehovah Nisi, which means in Hebrew, the Lord is our banner. This altar is located right beside the rock Moses struck where the water gushed out for the Israelites to drink. Now there are also some other amazing discoveries in this area that are fascinating to see and give more evidence that this area was traversed by the Israelites. Ryan Morrow, who recently visited this area and produced an excellent documentary called Finding the Mountain of Moses, the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia, says some of the following information. He says the name of Rephidim means place of rest. Hebrew inscriptions that have been found in this area have been interpreted to say place of rest, the definition of Rephidim. Closer to the mountain, inscriptions have been found that Dr. Miles Jones, a scholar of ancient Hebrew, believes are talking about the battle with the Amalekites. He says one of the inscriptions refers to the death of an Amalekite. Nearby, there are two inscriptions that Dr. Jones believes are marking where a Hebrew mother and daughter died. To go to the Jabal Nodes. He said, no, don't go there. There is military already there. If you go there, they will catch you. I said, no problem, let's go there. And he said, no, no, no. He asked me, he offered to me 200 real. Saudi 200 real, it means that you can buy one piece of gold. And I said, okay, no problem. I will give you the 200 real but you should be taking me to go to Jabalos. He said, okay, I will go, let's go. And then he is, was driving in front of me. I'm following him, you know. And then after that, I think around 15 to 20 minutes, he said, that this one is Jabalos. When I look, it's nothing there. I said, no, this one is not Jabalos. He said, he said to me, if you pay 100 real more, I will bring to you to the <laughs> Jabalos. <laughs> it's an Arab businessman. <laughs> then suddenly I say to him, look, we have a contract 200 real. If you want 100 real more, it means you broke our contract. Go to your house. I go to myself. If I found gold, I will not give it to you anything to you. He said, no, 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 let's go, let's go. But that times I drive myself because I know maybe way to, because already we know the directions, you know. So I'm following the, my way. And I will tell you, I, Saudi, the sky, is, there is no cloud because no rain, you know. But I found a big black cloud is touched the top of the mountains. Okay. So I thought maybe if I go that place will be Jabalos. We are the far away, but we know the direction because okay. the, it's like a signal, you know. So I'm following, following, following. But the, the, the cloud is always is moving, depends on the wind, you know. But this one is not moved. He touched the top of the mountain and slowly, slowly it's coming down. It's like a, wow. with a cloud of pillar, you know. And then I follow, follow, follow. And the last moment when I arrived, that mountain was the Chabalos. <laughs> wow. So that's how you found it. Like God put a cloud there. Yeah. Wow. And then I stopped there. When I come out, suddenly, on my back sunshine, but this black cloud completely covered all around the mountains. Wow. From inside, it started lighting, tendering, like God appeared uh, <laughs> 3,500 years before. Wow. I was afraid, really. This is your first trip there? Yeah, first trips. Wow. And suddenly, I fell down. I started to pray to God. Mm. You know, the rain dropped on my body. And 
you know the tender the the sound inside the mountain is huge you feel the like earthquake also shaking the ground i was afraid that some stone is falling down from the mountain and tendering and writing after that i was afraid you know pray to the god please we are the sin you know <laughs> you know the more than 50 years old you know what i did before <laughs> so i started to think about wow. everything is to uh, pull it out to god and mm -hmm. then the all my family afraid to inside the car, and the Bedouin also they afraid in the car. I pray and pray, pray, and suddenly I feel something, you know, very quiet. When I look, and the whole cloud is gone, suddenly, wow. and sunshine again. And Bedouin he come to me, hey, 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 I say why? Maybe the writing, <laughs> you have happened something like this, and then I asked him the. Did you see something like this happen? He said he's more, almost 80 years old. He said, i never seen all my life. Wow. And this yes. time is not the raining season. Yes. Why is something happened like this? I say, I don't know. <laughs> if this is Mount Sinai, this is very significant. Mm -hmm. So why hasn't the archaeologist mm -hmm. gone there and investigated this? Yes. No one can enter that place, archaeological area, or no one can excavations. So up to today, even there is, looks like a Bible, the stone structure is there, and 12 stone pillar is there, and earlier cave is there. Everything is there. What is written like Bibles, 100% is there. But now the Islam people occupied here. So who can go inside? Nobody can inside. Since AD 610, when Islamic occupied in this area, you cannot go inside. You want to go, but you cannot. You try to apply the official visa for the excavation in this place. You think they will release visa to you? No. If the Mount Sinai was open place, like uh, Egypt or the, if the Mount Sinai was in the, the, the America yes. or somewhere, it would be destroyed everything, yes. Yes. like uh, the, the Jerusalem. Yes. But this one, 3,500 years, he protect himself. So many tribes, so many generations, and come and go, come and go, but he keep it long time in the desert. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, last day before the Jesus coming. Very few selection people bring to show to this place, to show them where is the real Mount Sinai. Let me tell you, Jesus' times, he did a lot of things. Sometimes you don't know how to work, but the, 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 the Jesus, when he wake up, he suddenly work. The blind, he open eyes, dumbs, he can talk. Like Nazareth, he was after die three days already start smelling his body, but he come out he alive. But you think that times all the people they believe that Jesus? No. Who believe? Weakness peoples, child, no power peoples. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. 
with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. Uh, yes, I, I've been studying archaeology and ancient history for a long time, and old Persian, and I'm Jewish, and I was educated in the Old Testament, and I think it's important for people to realize that archaeologists and geologists have been in the Middle East for well over 100 years using modern methods. Many of them are dedicated Christians and Jews and Muslims, all of whom believe in the Old Testament. And the reason why none of them think uh, that Noah's Ark could be on Mount Ararat is because from what we know of modern science, it would take Mount Ararat being, I don't know what, 13,000, 14,000 feet, it would take such a huge flood to place an ark there that the flood would leave signs all over, virtually all over the Middle East, and there are no signs whatsoever of such a huge flood. There are small local floods in you know, Sumer and Eridu and Kish and places like that, but virtually no signs, no geological signs of uh, a flood. Mr. Wyatt? And, uh, okay, I appreciate your observation there, uh, sir. Now, uh, we will have to agree with you on the fact that this boat could not be on air at for many reasons. It's a post-flood volcano. There's uh, glaciers with the associated glacier flow, and the Bible specifies that the ark landed in mountains, plural, of Uratu, and that was quite a large empire out there. And uh, so it is not on Mount Ararat. It's 12 miles to the south south, on a place called uh, Mount Mosser, or Mountain of Pain, or something to that extent. Now, as to your worldwide evidences of a flood, I will disagree with you there, sir. Uh, there is evidence of worldwide flood because of marine uh, fossils uh, at the Cretaceous level everything, and that's a roughly average of 70, or rather 7,000 feet around the globe, and everything above that is obviously upthrusted material. And so uh, when you say that these people all agree, I, I have to agree that the predominance of people in this type of research say this, but sadly they are quoting the textbooks that they studied in school and they have not done field archaeology on this or they would not say that. On June 20, 1987, in the mountains of Ararat, Turkey officially recognized the discovery of Noah's Ark. Located on a mountainside about 15 miles south of the volcanic Mount Ararat, the remains of the massive ship were dedicated during a special ceremony. Guest of honor was Ron Wyatt due to his 10 years of research at the site. The story began in 1957 during the Cold War when aerial photos taken of eastern Turkey while searching for Soviet missile bases revealed a strange boat-shaped formation in the mountains about 6,300 feet above sea level. Life magazine reported on the story after an expedition from the United States went to the site in 1960. Blowing holes in the strange formation, the members of the team came away with the conclusion that there was nothing there of any archaeological interest. Ron Wyatt, like many others, read the story, but he was of the opinion that the site needed further exploration. There had been many claims of seeing Noah's Ark on the volcanic Mount Ararat, but Ron knew that it was a stratovolcano and he believed that nothing would have been able to survive there. He noted the biblical account of the location of the ark. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. On Ron Wyatt's first trip to the region in 1977, he didn't know where to begin searching, and he only had three days in the area. We were looking at all these mountains we were going through, and Dad realized He's like, guys, you see how rugged this place is? He said, do you know that we have no clue as to what direction to look in once we get there? And uh, we're like, yeah, because we didn't have the map coordinates. We had nothing except the picture in the book and, you know, the area 
of where it was around Mount Ararat that it was taken. And so we were becoming real skeptical on whether we were going to get to see anything this trip. And then once we got off the train, we hired a cab to take us in to Dugo Bozit, uh, the town close to Mount Ararat. And uh, while we were driving, it was at night, and Dad said, guys, he quoted the scripture. And so we, Dad said we should all say a prayer that God help us know which, which way to look. And we basically all three just said a separate prayer, bowed our heads and said a separate prayer in the car silently. And uh, just a few minutes later, uh, the car died and everything went off. The headlights, the engine shut off, everything. So he had to immediately pull over because it was night and you couldn't see. And so he got up under the hood and looked and he couldn't find anything wrong, didn't know what was wrong with it. And he just goes like this. He couldn't speak much English, so he just goes, you know. And he sits back down in the car and tries it and it starts back up. Well, during that time, Dad said, hey, you know, we just got done saying that prayer and then the car died. He said, just in case that was God's answer in our prayer, let's pile up a big pile of rocks here on the side of the road to mark where this car stopped. Okay, so we did it. And then the car started back up and we hopped back in and went on down the road and it did it again. Everything, lights and everything shut off again. And we're like, oh man, you know? Mm -hmm. And dad said, well, you know, let's pile up another pile of rocks here. And so we did that and then sat there a few minutes and the car started right back up again and just went a few more miles and it did it again the third time. And by then, my dad was a little skeptical. Even he said, well, oh, guys, I work. think the car's probably just messed up. Yeah. <laughs> he said, but just in case, let's pile up another big pile of rocks here just in case it, this is something, you know. And so we all figured, well, yeah, the car's just breaking down. And so then after that, the car started right back up and we drove on into town and got our hotel room. Yeah, and then, no, no trouble. Yeah, I got the hotel room. Then the next day, I guess we got a cab and he took us out. It was somebody from that, from the village around there. He was our guide actually. And he took us out and we found the pile of rocks, the first pile. and. I guess we went to the first pile. Yeah. We had three piles there. I think we went to the first one first and walked out. And, you know, it was hot. We had a canteen. Ended up having a hole in it. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, we drank what water we could before it all emptied out. Yeah, so we all drank it so it wouldn't just Yeah, we all got sunburnt in that. But we found the anchor stone, which we had never seen one. Dad had seen some in pictures, some smaller ones, but nothing that big. So he kind of knew what it was. And, uh, and so, there were eight crosses on the anchor stone. Yeah, eight crosses on the anchor stone. Yeah, the next pile. Did the next one go to the, the To house? the village and the yeah, house. Yeah, the next, the next pile of rocks went to Noah's. The house and the graveyard. Yeah. This photo was taken in 1977 by Ron Wyatt, showing the walls of Noah's home since then, all the walls have been torn down by local treasure seekers. In the front yard stood this large tombstone. On the tombstone was a drawing of eight people and a boat on a wave. The second largest person was looking downward with their eyes closed. This indicates that this was Mrs. Noah's tombstone. After Mr. Wyatt showed this to someone, that person later hired others to exhume Mrs. Noah's 18-foot sarcophagus. And then the third pile was actually Noah's Ark, which was probably the first pile. Well, yeah, because we did it Because backwards. we came back from it the opposite way. And it, it just, it, it was amazing because I had never in my life said a prayer and had an answer that definite, that quick, just knowing full well that, I mean. Of course, that night we thought it was just bumps. the car breaking down, but the next day when we walked out and found that, we knew that it was, you know, because like I say, it, it was, uh, the countryside was so rough, barren, 
We couldn't have found that. There was no way in the world no. we could have found it. We didn't even know to go to the right or left side of the road or no idea. And so we pulled up on walked the straight out yeah. to him. <laughs> but the factor that captured his interest the most was the length given in the Life magazine story, 500 feet. Most people were looking for a 437-foot Noah's Ark based on the Hebrew cubit. But Ron again went to the Bible to learn more. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Moses was the author of the Genesis account of the flood. He would have known the cubit of the Egyptians. The Hebrew cubit didn't come into existence until there was a Hebrew nation after Moses' death. The Encyclopedia Britannica stated, The Egyptian cubit is generally recognized as having been the most ubiquitous or universal standard of linear measurement in the very ancient world. The royal cubit equals 20.62 inches. This would mean Noah's Ark was much longer than 437 feet. Seventeen years after the Life magazine article, Ron finally made the journey to Turkey. When he saw the boat-shaped object, he saw that it looked just like it did in 1960, and he knew he would need permission to excavate in order to learn anything about what was beneath the surface. So he returned home and enlisted a number of friends to help him pray for an earthquake to reveal more. In late 1978, he learned of an earthquake in eastern Turkey and returned in August of 1979. When he arrived, he was overwhelmed by what he saw. The earthquake had dropped the soil around the object and a large crack extended the entire length. He could see what looked to him like the remains of decayed rib timbers along the now exposed sides. Also, he was able to measure the depth of the debris and measure the length. It was 515 feet, or exactly 300 royal Egyptian cubits. He was now convinced. He carefully combed the surface, looking for evidence that it was a shipwreck. He saw what he believed were petrified structures of an ancient ship whose deck had collapsed. He saw what looked like deck joists and deck support timbers. In 1984, Ron met and became friends with Colonel Jim Irwin, the former astronaut. Colonel Irwin was searching for Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, but he was very gracious and was interested in seeing the boat-shaped site. Ron had brought a metal detector to the site to see if there was a pattern of metal readings. In the presence of Colonel Irwin and others on his team, Ron employed the detectors. He found distinct metal lines down the entire length of the object, while no metal readings were obtained just outside of it. Ron asked Colonel Irwin, who had impressive scientific community connections, if he could have the strange specimen tested. Colonel Irwin sent the specimen to Los Alamos National Labs, where geophysicist John Baumgartner performed the analysis. The results of that analysis captured Dr. Baumgartner's interest. The specimen contained manganese, also titanium and aluminum, among others, and these were not in the form found in nature. Due to the sophistication of the metals, he questioned whether a missile had crashed on the mountainside and Ron had found the remains. The exciting evidences of the metal lines and the analysis of the specimens brought two new researchers into the work. Dr. Baumgartner and David Fassel, a marine salvage expert who knew all about ships and their construction. They both joined the team. Oh, look at that. Oh, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, let me get a close-up of that. Kind of, um... You want my hand in there for... Yeah, just to point at those little okay. flakes of iron that are coming out, like right there. There and there. Huh. 
That's a strong reading. Hmm. Well, I'd say that, that, uh, those frames right there. Okay. Uh, keep walking. Do you want, do you want a measuring tape to measure these things, how far apart they are? Dr. Baumgartner and Ron scanned the entire site with three different types of metal detectors. Placing rocks at each metal reading, they then attached tapes to show the lines. While Turkish scientists and archaeologists did their own research, Ron and his associates continued their work. The next step was subsurface interface radar. There's the longitudinal bulkhead. You ought to see them pop it out, Ron. Yeah, there There's they are. Here. There's yeah. another one. There's the key line right there. Yeah. Oh, Ron, the lines are there! <laughs> the lines are there. Okay, we're going to walk over. Yeah. Take a look. Leave it, leave it running so everybody knows that we're not cheating here, right? <laughs> you got it, Cole. Okay. Now, this is the west, the west bulkhead. Okay, can you look through there and... All right. This is the west bulkhead. All right. That was over there. And he walked easterly. Here we start getting the longitudinal bulkheads. Here, 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 here. here. Okay. You see there how it shows up? All right. The initial scans were very impressive, showing internal structure consistent with bulkheads, and rooms. But to be sure they were interpreting the data correctly, Ron took the scan printouts to Geophysical Survey Systems, the developer and manufacturer of the radar. This data is not, it does not represent natural geology. It's, it's a man-made structure. These reflections are occurring very per- periodic, too periodic to be random na- natural type interface. There was no longer any doubt that this was the remains of something man-made. In late 1986, the Turks announced their decision. The ceremony was set for June 1987. During that ceremony, the governor asked Ron to demonstrate the radar on site for the journalists and military officials. When Ron showed them a readout that he said looked like an intact timber, The governor then instructed a soldier to dig right there. What emerged was this petrified section of fossilized, hand-wrought timber. Sectioning showed it to be laminated wood. Five layers of timber glued together with pitch, clearly visible oozing from the end. It was tested at Galbraith Labs for organic carbon. The level of organic carbon was extremely high, thus proving this object was once living matter, consistent with wood. Using radar equipment, Ron Wyatt discovered an open cavity on the starboard side of the arc. Utilizing a core drilling technique, he was able to gain access to the interior of the arc. Stunning evidence was pulled from the belly of the ship. Using an improvised long rake device, Petrified animal dung was extracted from the hull. Next, cat hair was also pulled from the cavity. Then, a petrified antler was extracted. These are all items that one would expect to find in the bottom of the ark. 
The Bible tells us the antediluvians were skilled in metalworking. Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. This large metal rivet, or metal washer around a metal rod, was found by Ron Wyatt when he had taken a tour group to the site in 1991. The center rod had been struck while it was hot, causing it to flare out, holding the washer in place. Test results showed that it contained 8% aluminum metal. Aluminum metal is man-made, thus proving the site to be man-made. Skeptics have said Mr. Wyatt was lying about the testing, but was he really? When the Ark Discovery International team was at the Ark site, they used a metal detector to locate metal fittings on the Ark. This is a crescent-shaped piece of metal that had been a circular washer in its better days and was found near the bow on the port side. A portion of it tested at Galbraith Labs in Tennessee, and the results were stunning. It was 8% aluminum metal, just as Ron White's test had revealed. The test additionally showed a small amount of titanium metal that is also man-made. The ARC Discovery team continued its analysis at the site and located another fitting on the starboard side. A portion of it was sent to Galbraith Labs for testing, and again, there were incredible results. It contained 8% aluminum metal, 1.3% titanium metal, plus 3.8% magnesium metal, all indicative of the arc formation being a man-made structure. The Encyclopedia Britannica tells us, because of its chemical activity, aluminum never occurs in the metallic form in nature. These unique metal components are special markers that were left behind which prove the site is without a doubt a man-made structure utilizing high-tech construction techniques consistent with what we should find in Noah's Ark. Modern man didn't discover how to make aluminum metal until around 1900, but the antediluvians had this knowledge in their day. Other metal fittings were found on the port side of the deck. Our metal detector picked up metal readings where a rectangular plate was positioned on a flat plane. This plate originally had six rivets, one is still visible on the left side. Now we're going to come to some evidence that I believe is really strong in supporting this area as the site of Noah's Ark. In this area have been found around 30 drogue and anchor stones. As mentioned earlier, these drogue and anchor stones were used as ship stabilizers to better withstand storms and cause drag so ships weren't driven and tossed on the oceans. Found in this area are around 30 of these drogue and anchor stones. They are found scattered along a path running from west to east. It appears as the waters were receding from the great flood, the drogue stones began hitting the land under the water and then they were cut loose. The remaining stones are generally in the area where the ark eventually came to rest. Many of these stones have holes carved in them for connecting ropes from the ark to the stones. Some of the holes have broken over the years in some of the stones. So on the tops of these stones, they had holes in them and the ropes would go through those holes and then they were attached to the ark. These drogue stones were continually used in ancient times after the flood and can be found in places like Israel and the Nile River in Egypt. So these drogue stones were something commonly used in ancient ship staling, and they were used as ballast, they were used as stabilizers to keep the ship stable and to keep it headed into the waves so that it wasn't tossed to and fro on the oceans. These drogue stones are over 200 miles from the closest ocean and about 5,300 feet or 1,615 meters above sea level. They have no business being here other than that a huge ship like the Ark dropped them here. So they're a long ways from any water and they have no business to be here other than that a large ship dropped them here. The numerous stones discovered near the Drupanar site are the largest ever discovered in the world. This would make sense as the ark was massive in size and would need extra large stones to stabilize it. Many of these stones have crosses carved on them from early Christians visiting this site. 
and others have crosses that are from the Crusader period from around 1200 AD. Some of the stones have eight crosses on them, representing Noah and his family that were saved from the flood. Several of the stones have been used as grave markers as well. One of these stones has an ancient carving that appears to be the Tower of Babel. The three layers carved on this stone are believed to represent the three levels or decks of the ark as mentioned in the Bible. Another stone has unknown ancient writings on it that have yet to be interpreted and translated. All these carvings reveal that this site was venerated long ago and visited by religious people for thousands of years. Another large stone is believed to have been used as a sounding stone for measuring the depth of the water under the ark. We all In 1990, Ron performed what he called a mini excavation, where he took shovels and bent the blades into a giant razor. He and his associates then shaved off a very thin layer from one section, smoothing it to show the color difference between the structure members and the matrix. We are now standing on the middle deck of the ark and now pan over to the interior of the port side where we can see four horizontal protrusions in a row. They are arranged in a regular pattern indicating man-made construction. These would have been horizontal deck support timbers extending toward the middle of the deck. At the stern, we can see the symmetrical shape of the boat, including the center mound where the decks have collapsed one on top of another. Continuing to inspect the stern, we can see five objects in a row along the inside port area of the deck. These have been measured at regular intervals and appear to be vertical posts that would have supported the deck. Resistivity imaging is complex and has improved greatly with the advent of more powerful computers and resistivity systems. Basically, an electrical charge is used to map underground features based on the electrical resistance of the objects under the earth. It took several days to complete the scans, and what the 3D images showed was consistent with that of a ship that had suffered a great deal of damage. After all, if it is Noah's Ark, as we all believe, it is the oldest man-made object on Earth and is impaled on a massive outcrop of rock. The scans clearly showed that this was not a natural object and it looked like a massive shipwreck. Looking at the hull shape in three dimensions, the resistivity images show that the front section, which lies beneath the ground, resembles the form of a ship which is streamlined and with the shape of a deep hull design. The resistivity values of the material forming the hull are also the same above the ground as they are beneath. This indicates that the same material makes up the entire hull shape and that this material is relatively impermeable to water. It is a hard substance which has retained its shape. Around the edge of the site are features which Ron believed to be the ribs of the ship. The scans revealed even more encouraging evidence than we could have ever asked for. They showed that the material forming these ribs continued below the ground surface and curved underneath the vessel just as a rib timber would be expected. The electrical resistivity of the material forming the rib was more resistive than the surrounding mud and the level of resistivity did not appear to change with depth. Ron Wyatt used to point on the inner side of the ship's hull to a series of equally spaced protrusions which are projected at 90 degrees from the outer edge of the hull towards the inside of the ship. He believed these were deck joists which once held a floor or ceiling of some type. 
the scans revealed that these protrusions were of the same resistivity as the apparent rib material. They also revealed that they extended back into the hull and connected directly to the adjacent rib, exactly as Ron believed. In 2019, radar scans were again done, which we helped finance but were not present for. They also revealed the presence of straight lines, which were consistent with walls and 90-degree lines consistent with being rooms. We believe this is a ship, a massive ship. It bears the shape of a ship and the features of a ship. It is 6,300 feet up in the mountains of Ararat. The internal features are exactly the dimensions given in the Bible using the ancient cubit of 20.6 inches, later called the Royal Egyptian Cubit. Finding Noah's Ark means nothing if it does not strengthen our faith or lead a non-believer to the knowledge of the truth. The truth that we have a Creator who loves us and wants us to come to Him and be saved by the blood of His Son. Photos taken at different times of the year have brought out different features of the boat. There was so much convincing evidence uncovered at the site that the Turkish government declared this area to be Noah's Ark National Park. And yet today, the world is unaware of this amazing discovery. When I started praying that God would change me and do whatever was necessary in my life so that he could work in and through me to help others come to him and be saved, things started to change. So regardless of his doctrine, regardless of his denomination, Regardless of how he viewed end time prophecy, which is all completely different than mine, God looks at the heart. He looks at those who are humble. He reveals his secret to those who are humble and those who truly are seeking him. Ron Wyatt claimed to find the blood of Jesus Christ. He claimed to find it in Jerusalem in an underground chamber where the garden tomb is, where Golgotha is, on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. I'm going to look at this objectively, and I'm not going to say that he absolutely did find it, but I'm going to show you several reasons that indicate that he was telling the truth. And you need to use discernment. Pray to God over this. Don't just watch it and believe everything. Actually test the spirits and see whether these things are so. Prove all things. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. So anyway, I was walking along the cliff base behind this bus station back in this area. I was walking through there. My left hand went out.
without my brain doing it. And my mouth said, that's Jeremiah's grotto in the Ark of the Covenants in there. Well, I was dumbfounded. This sort of thing doesn't happen to me. In fact, you know, I resist that sort of thing because people that I consider wackos say they have those kinds of experiences. And I still think that most of them that say they have these experiences are wackos. But sometimes, in other words, I don't feel comfortable with that kind of experience. But our tickets were due the next morning, so we flew home. I told the man, he said, that's wonderful. He says, we'll let you dig there. We'll give you all the help you need, a place to stay, provide you food, do your laundry. And this is a Israeli. They don't do that. We went home, and I had no idea why the Ark of the Covenant had been there. I'd never even thought about it. You know, my cup was running over already with things that God has shown me. And so, you know, I was not looking for anything else. So I went home, prayed, and asked the Lord to help me understand why the Ark of the Covenant might possibly be in that place. I was impressed to read the history of the conquest of Jerusalem. And in this uh, Second Kings chapter, 25, it says that Nebuchadnezzar built forts against the city round about. That in modern uh, language is a siege wall. Now this meant that nobody could take anything out of the city or bring anything in the city. So the Ark of the Covenant had to be hidden in the city, under the city, or inside the siege wall. All right? Well, <clears throat> we don't know for sure where the Babylonian siege wall was located, but we know where Titus's siege wall was located. All right? Catapults had the same range back in Nebuchadnezzar's time as they did in Titus's time. And they always built these siege walls out of range of the catapults that were defending the city. So we know where it had to have been. And from that siege wall, people would have not observed, you know, watchmen walking the wall, the siege wall, couldn't observe somebody bringing something out into that cliff over there. So I thought, okay, that makes it reasonable. We got ready, came back and started digging January 1979. In January 6, 1982, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I found the Ark of the Covenant. Right? You would not believe the amount of stone and dirt and everything we had made. The, the little Arab guy that was letting us eat at his restaurant, he was a full-grown man, but he's about that tall and small, petite. So as we went through this cave system, he would crawl into the chambers, and I'd give him a light, and he'd shine it around, and I'd peek through to see if it looked like anything in there. So we did this over and over, and uh, we came to this one hole, that we had, I mean, you wouldn't believe where all we had gone in that cave. And at this point in time, we had gone about 45 feet down and then back up. And here this hole was in the wall, about that big around. And it, there was a stalactite hanging right down the middle of it. It's the only stalactite I had seen in the cave that wasn't just little ones. This was a big one, and I have it in my collection of things. So I broke it off, made the hole big enough for him to get in, and he was crawling in there, and I started to hand him the light so he could do what we had been doing, you know, several days. He came tearing out of there. His mind, uh, eyes were big as human eyes can get. And he said, what's in there? What's in there? I'm not going back in there. And I said, well, what did you see? He said, I didn't see anything. 
And I thought, well, okay. Now he had been in tighter places than that and had not responded that way. So I got this little beam of light, you know, in a very dark place here. And I thought, that is divine terror. You know, that's supernatural terror. So I figured there's got to, that is either where the Ark of the Covenant is or it's the way to get to it, one or the other. And God doesn't want this fellow to know where it is. So anyway, he said, he, he just said, I, I, am, I must get out of here. So off he went. So I made the hole big enough for me to get in. I got in there, and folks, it was full of rocks, bigger than these here, up to within 18 inches or so of the ceiling. If this young man hadn't been terrorized and come scooting out of there like he did, I would not have gone in that place. Who needs rocks? We've been moving thousands of them for three years. So anyway, I crawled in there with the flashlight, and I crawled around on top of the rocks, and I shined the light down between the cracks in the rock, and there a gold, flat gold thing uh, reflected back at me. So I moved over and shined down to another. It was two reflections, one here, one there, and one over here. So I knew it was a flat gold top. And I thought, the Ark of the Covenant, I forgot about the cherubim, you know, sitting on top. They'd have been poking up through it. That was the top of the mercy seat. But anyway, I started moving these rocks, and I stuck them everywhere I could. By the time I got down to that gold surface, I had them behind my shoulders, leaning back against them, and uh, it, turned, it was the table of showbread. Well, hey, that's not a bad thing. Huh? But anyway, I was looking for the Ark of the Covenant, and... It was only then that I took time to carefully examine the rest of the chamber. See, I had just crawled in, took a quick look, and started checking down under the rocks. So as I moved the flashlight along the wall, I saw a stone box sitting against the wall about this low, this much space between it and the ceiling. The lid was broke, slid around. And right above it was a crack with dark brown looking material at the bottom of, on the bottom of this crack. And I was able to see the top of the lid of the box. On both sides of the broken pieces was more of this brown stuff. All of a sudden I realized. I was sitting in front of the Ark of the Covenant, yes, and that Christ's blood had come down. Yes, you could wonder it now. I had never heard anybody preach anything about that sort of possibility. And it was too much I, when I regained consciousness and looked at my watch again 45 minutes that passed from the time I crawled in the chamber because I figured I'd find the Ark of the Covenant in there. I wanted to know what time it was. So anyway, it was 2 o'clock when I entered the chamber. And after I regained consciousness, it was 245. I couldn't see down in there, but I knew what it was. Now, I'm not a body language expert, um, but this guy seems to be telling the truth. He seems to be recollecting real events by the, his hand movements and just by the way that he explains things. And I, I cut a lot of this out as well just to condense it for this video, but... Again, I'm going to be objective about this. My my main point here is that he really does seem to be recalling events as he experienced them.
If you were to visit the garden tomb today in Israel, you would be able to see the tomb that Jesus Christ rose from. You can see the, the skull, where the Bible describes it as Skull Hill or Golgotha. And you can also see the place where they covered up Ron Wyatt's excavation, the place where Jesus was crucified. And it's pretty hidden, so you have to know where it is. This family here who is visiting the garden tomb, fortunately for them, the gardener, he knew where Ron Wyatt's excavation was. And then they met a guy who said some pretty interesting things. He was putting the puzzle pieces together and connecting the dots. So have a listen to what he has to say as well. Yeah, our prayer that we pray in the Lord's Prayer as as in heaven, so on earth this right. was God's desire. Because he knew that we were uh, slaves to sin. Mm -hmm. We were slaves to the slave owner at the time, and the slave owner had been, you know, ownership had been given over to the devil. Well, when he actually was crucified, it was the innocent lamb, the lamb, okay. the God that takes away the sin of the world. Well, it says that he took his heaven, his blood into the heavenly holy of holies. Okay. Mm -hmm. But also as in earth, because right. it says there's three, three. witnesses in three the earth. Witnesses the blood, the water, and the spirit. So the blood and the water came out of the side of Jesus. At the time of the crucifixion, there was a great earthquake, and the rocks were rent. And of course, you can see, if you go back there, you can see where they filled it in, but I can't, you know, I saw oh. it before it got filled in, oh, and they did? literally filled in the cracks that came down through here. So you yourself saw. I saw it before saw they the filled it in. And you can see it on the other side where they did fill it in, but the crack comes down here and the crack came down and it was right at the base of the cross. And so then after Jesus had died, speared, out came blood and water, poured down, and it dropped onto the mercy seat. Right. Exactly. So then have you been you've been to Zedekiah's ton of arcades mm -hmm. or whatever and in there and I know, everything? I, I know essentially where it is. How to get in. So we were we that's one Two things we wanted to do today was come here and see this mm -hmm. and go to his t t tunnel and kind of just see. We don't want to obviously try to find it, but because right. you, you actually saw Ron Wyatt and yeah. met him. Yeah. What was your name? Robert. Yeah. Name? I mean, that was, that was 30 years ago. Really? Uh huh. Wow. And so I, I was just sitting across the table. I was, I was a, a proud young kid and I, I talked to him for a while and then I realize how stupid I am because when you're in the presence of somebody who's humble and then your pride gets really shown for what it is and so yeah. you know, I was pretty yeah, so, so this wow so the, so it's underneath us this is the ark of the captain and why people don't understand that they don't under, I guess they don't understand the covenant right. they don't understand the blood they right. don't understand 
what God was doing. Right. The, the reason we have the freedom and the spirit that we have is because the blood's down right. on that. On the ark. It was supposed to right. anoint the, the, the ark. Water I know. There, and that's what made it so that we can have the spirit it's, because it's well, holy. Must, yeah. I heard that they sent six people in to try to pull that out of there. Yeah, yeah and they died. Right. Do you know why? They weren't allowed to be in there yet. Papa Wasn't said no. Time. But do you know why? Well, then they're more... Yeah, they would profane the ark. Yeah. Well, what's profaning the ark? Well, what's on the ark? What's on over there? The blood is. The blood. What's the blood doing? It's speaking, still is speaking a better thing than that of right. Abel. And the thing is, it's the throne of God in the earth, as in heaven, so on earth. We got right. we got something rocking. I, mean, I say rocking, but we got something going on right. here. This is uh, you know to understand um, that won't be messed with until that which right. restrains him is taken away. Exactly. That's and when uh, that happens, right. we're talking. We're going to have hell revealed on this earth, mm -hmm. and that's the terrific great yep. tribulation. That's important it. witness that is going to be an important witness. Right. That blood on the ark, so that has to be preserved until the time's right. Must, right. must be. Yeah, and then when the yeah. the uh, abomination of desolation is when the, That's exactly. the dude, the, the man of sin, sits on the throne and proclaims himself God. Right, Elohim. so whatever he does yeah. to profane, because that's what the devil's uh, always trying to get yes. in to the midst of something to profane it. I'm so thankful to run into you guys. Yeah. Yeah, this, and this, this is have the real confirmation deal. from someone else. Yeah. We try to tell our friends this, and they just don't—they they just don't want to believe this, it because it's too too crazy. Deal. So, if you're wondering why they're so interested in Zedekiah's cave, it's because Ron Wyatt found the entrance. There's an actual tunnel that'll take you right to the Ark of the Covenant chamber, and it's sealed off right now because Israel sealed it off. And then you can also see a wall that Ron Wyatt is standing in here and let's take a closer look at this wall So I'm going to read from a book that was recently published with all of Ron Wyatt's discoveries and apparently on this gold detector test that they did at the Garden Tomb. In 2016, 36 tests were done using a directional metal detector in order to confirm the Ark of the Covenant. Prior to conducting these tests, the detector was tested to see if it could detect a gold coin about 15 feet away and next to try and detect an 8-inch, 18-karat gold chain about 10 feet away. In both cases, the detector pointed to these objects without failure. Over the course of several days, the detector was used in front of the cutouts in the rock of the crucifixion site of Christ that we had mentioned earlier. Below this area should be the Ark of the Covenant. But could a detector pick up a reading for gold and the Ark at a depth of 50 feet? Tests were done in front of the rock escarpment about 20 feet away, then at 45 degree angles, then over to each side. In every test result, the detector pointed to the correct location of the arc. After receiving these readings, the detector was positioned over the spot that should be the center of where the detector had been pointing. When placed over the spot, the detector began to spin, meaning the gold is directly below. This was still another confirmation. When moved away from this spot several feet, it would point back to where the arc should be. It repeated this time after time without failure. The idea then came that the detector should get a real workout. How about trying it from 65 and 100 feet, respectively, from three different directions? Could the detector still find the arc? First, it was positioned at the overlook for Skull Hill, that is a raised platform at about 100 feet from where the ark should be. Amazingly, it once again pointed to the ark. 
Next it was positioned 65 feet directly out from the rock face, and once again it pointed to the arc. Finally it was positioned 100 feet toward the entrance to the garden tomb grounds, and once again it pointed to the arc. In order to get these long distance test results, there would have to be a large amount of gold in that location. All in all, there were 36 test results. Every test that was done with the detector confirmed there was gold in the direction of the arc as reported by the late Ron Wyatt. There were no tests that contradicted the site. End quote. So you can see it's starting to spin because the guy is going over that spot again. And whenever this guy goes over that spot, it spins. And whenever he's not at that spot, it points back to that spot. Now I have to admit, this was one of the most difficult things to research out of all the stuff that I've looked into when it comes to Ron White because these metal detectors, or as they're more properly known as frequency detectors, have a lot of fake scam versions floating around on the internet. And it was very difficult to determine if this is actually something that could possibly be real at all. And once I asked my wife, she looked into it, she actually found out that these things uh, can be real. Uh, it's just really rare because people are not looking for giant amounts of gold like this thing would find. If you're going to find a random piece of gold underground, uh, you're not gonna, like where are you going to look? This thing is not going to work very well for finding a little piece of gold that's buried into the ground like most people are going to randomly find if they find anything at all. I mean the device itself, these devices cost a lot of money, the real ones, and if you spend that much money and you actually end up finding something as well, like those two things might be kind of hard to put together because of just the statistical likelihood of you just walking around and finding a gold watch buried into the ground or something is just so rare that the reports of success are just nowhere to be found. So anyways, that's how the market kind of works for this item, but there are real ones, as you can see in this video. This is the video that my wife found from a channel where the guy can actually build the thing himself, it seems. He demonstrates how the detector will always point back to the gold coins, and then it'll start spinning once it's above it, just like in the Ark of the Covenant video. Notice how when he pulls the device back away from the coins, it stops spinning and it starts pointing. But when he gets closer to the coins, it starts to spin again because it's right over the top of the coins. It's right over the top of the gold. So it's not the same model, but it's the same same system. It's the same type of thing. You can look as much as you want, you'll never be able to find that model that they use for the Ark of the Covenant online because it's not even sold online. Because the people who are actually using these things, they don't go on the internet to buy them. They buy them in person where it can actually be demonstrated that they work. This whole time it was spinning was right at the top of the coins that he planted there. This shows that this type of device is real and it does work. And I do believe this is a very strong confirmation that there is a massive amount of gold below the site where Ron Wai claimed the Ark of the Covenant to be. Now, there's more. I'm going to read a personal testimony by a guy named Ian Fain, who is an eyewitness to a video shot in the cave taken by Ron himself. So let me just start reading. <clears throat> this is, by the way, from an email correspondence that he had made with ArcDiscovery.com. This may be an appropriate time to mention publicly that I and several other Christians have watched with our own eyes a video which Ron shot inside the cave before the furniture was rearranged. The crack in the roof was clearly visible with the blood still on it. The table was there in close-up, and many piles of skins. The ark was there, but was covered by a brilliant white light, which hid it from the camera as Ron panned around the cave. To the best of my knowledge, there is only one copy of it in existence, Ron's original, and it's not in America now. It's in a safe place of the Lord's own choosing, to which I once took Aaron Sen, who has met the keeper but has not viewed the tape. I was an eyewitness of Ron's tape of the inside of the cave. I wasn't with him when he shot it, but I saw the tape not very long afterwards. Ron himself was keen that the tape should be seen widely. Events turned out otherwise, however. 
But for what is worth, I'm happy to answer any questions I can about the tape and what I saw on it. I last viewed it some years ago and my visual memory is not great. I'm far better with words. However, by the same token, my visual imagination is pretty bad too, which is probably a good thing for this purpose. My sole purpose in mentioning it here was to help strengthen the faith of some here whose confidence in Ron's word may have been shaken by doubt. How long is the videotape? The section shot inside the cave was part of a longer tape, most of which contained other less dramatic stuff. I'd say there were several minutes of material shot inside the cave. What quality is it? Shaky, steady, on a tripod, in color? Steady and in color. From what I can recall, I'd say it was almost certainly shot using a tripod and a single camera light, which Ron moved about in between shots from one part of the cave to another so as to get pictures of the content from different angles. What type of lighting used? Good quality or poor? Grainy footage or clear? Single light fixed to the camera. As Ron panned around the cave, the light moved with the camera. Off center, the edges of the frame were quite dark. The tape was free from grain, but the color balance was not great. I suppose it was NTSC, which in the days when I was a videotape engineer, we used to say stood for never the same color twice. Did you see any angels on the tape? No. Was there a timestamp on the tape itself that was displayed on the screen? Not that I recall there wasn't. How long ago did you see it? Pass. That information might assist those who want to find the tape. Have you ever talked to Ron about the tape? If so, what did he say? I never talked to him specifically about the tape. I did ask him questions about the Ark, about the Tables of Stone, and about the Book of the Law. I assumed at the time that everybody who knew anything of Ron's work had seen this tape along with all his other material. It was only when Bill Fry intercepted a post of mine to this list that I realized that this was not so. Even Bill hadn't seen it. The persons who have the tape, are they waiting for the right time to release it? Did Ron give it to him, her, them, or what's the reason for them holding it back? Same answer as to the previous question, I'm afraid. Sorry. From your perspective, is this the tape where Ron took out the tables of stone? Was this before or after the event if it's not the same footage? No, it's an earlier tape. Neither Ron nor the tables appeared on the tape I saw. How many people were with you when you viewed it and where did this occur? Australia? Only one person viewed it simultaneously with me, but several others had seen it just a few days previously. One has since gone to be with the Lord, but the others are still alive. The country name is under wraps, as per Q5. Does Ron say anything on the tape? If so, what does he say? No, Ron was the cameraman, but he didn't appear in front of the camera, and I don't recall his giving any verbal commentary on the sequence inside the cave. What does the table of showbread look like? To be honest, it looked dark bronze, but I suppose that was the effect of the camera light which probably had a predominantly blue spectrum. The table was rectangular and had a raised decorative border a few inches high running all around the top, which what I took to be cast pomegranates at regular intervals. The cave sequence opened with a close-up shot of one corner of the table, showing some fine workmanship in its making. Did you see the seven branch candlestick, and if so, what did it look like? No, I was consciously looking for it, but I didn't see it. Everybody asked this question. It's the most popular question after the Ark itself. You said you saw the skins piled up in a corner? They weren't piled in a corner. They were heaped everywhere, all over the floor and everything else, lots of them. What conditions were they in? I don't recall any close-ups of the coverings, but the general impression was one of grey dustiness. They were folded up as you would fold a lot of blankets, and some were obviously covering large objects underneath. The menorah may have been on its side under them. Did you see any other object in the cave? And if so, what were they? At the time, I thought this tape was going on general release and that I'd be getting a copy sometime, so I didn't make any mental notes. But I do remember seeing the stone box in which the Ark had been stored, with its lid moved to one side. I have a feeling that Goliath's sword was there, but I have no particular mental image of it. Just that we discussed it between ourselves, and the reason for our discussing it was probably that it was in there. Of course, the dominant feature was the Ark itself, and the fact that it was hidden by a brilliant white light. As Ron panned the camera around, a circle of light moved across the field of view until it filled the whole screen, 
then it moved off again at the other edge. Ron's verbal account of this was that the effect was only on the tape. No such light was visible to him inside the cave when he saw the arc plainly. It was only when he viewed the tape afterwards that he saw the light had covered the arc for the purpose of the recording. The other notable feature was the crack in the roof of the cave with the dark stain of blood on the one side of it, about the size of one's hand, I should think. The roof was not high. A man would probably have had to stoop to avoid hitting his head. Seeing the blood there was the most moving thing to me. I think if the Lord had wanted somebody to give a detailed account of the tape, he would have chosen somebody other than me to see it. My powers of visual observation and retention are famously bad. My principal contribution to this debate is simply that I can testify to having seen that tape, that it showed exactly what Ron said it did, and that I was awed at what I saw. I think we all were. Did the table of showbread have just one shelf, top one, or any below it too? I only remember seeing the top surface, and not much below it. I think it was perhaps partially covered by skins, but it was quite a while ago, and as I mentioned earlier, my visual memory is really terrible. How close to the ceiling was the Ark of the Covenant stone case? Very close. I remember being rather surprised at how low the roof was. I can't give you any meaningful estimate of the exact distance. I'd have to view the tape again to do that, but my memory is that it was about enough to crawl into and not much more. Was the chamber cleared out? Like was Ron shooting the video from the floor of the chamber, or was he standing on stones or what? You said he was close to the ceiling. Any thoughts on how close? The chamber was certainly not cleared out. In fact, apart from things like the lid of the stone box, it looked as though nobody had been in there for centuries, as I suppose they hadn't. The place looked like a lumber room, with things everywhere all over the floor, and of course all those heaps of skins, so that you would have to clamber over one thing to look at the next. Ron was about my height, six foot, and I'd reckon I'd have to stoop in there, but I think the camera was a foot or more so below head height. Was the stone case that held the ark in the middle of the chamber or up against one of the sides? From the opening shot, it was on the right hand side at the back. If the camera was central, that is, but what with there being so many objects in there, only those in front of the camera being illuminated, and the light in front of the arc disorienting things a bit, I couldn't swear to it. However, my memory is certainly that it wasn't in the center of the cave. I think it was close to a wall at the back. Did you see any openings into the chamber or the shape of the chamber? No, because of the limited lighting, that wasn't possible. Did it look like a high 8 video or something older? Actually, it didn't look too bad, all things considered. It was a difficult situation for an amateur shoot. I was never into amateur video. I worked with B&W 1-inch tape and 12-inch reels, so I couldn't guess which system it was. The picture quality seemed rather better than some of Ron's other stuff, though, so maybe he had taken particular care to get a hold of a good camera. Does the keeper of the video still have the tape? I guess he certainly could, but amazing as it sounds to us here, he has forgotten the cave sequence completely. As Aaron San and I discovered when we called upon him for the express purpose of having a look at it, in Aaron's case for the first time. Now in the context of our uneventful little lives, that sounds hard to believe. That anybody to whom these things mean so much could actually forget such a unique thing in his possession. This man is a spirit-filled believer in the Lord and is deeply appreciative of the significance of these matters. He supported Ron and contributed significantly to Ron's work. So he isn't ignorant. But he is a man to whom strange and sometimes dangerous things just happen. The same was true of his father, so it runs in the family. I have said sometimes that if and when World War III breaks out, it will be six feet away from where this man happens to be standing at that moment, a bit like being the guy who happened to be standing next to Crown Prince Ferdinand when he was shot in 1914. This man has about a dozen of Ron's tapes, but he has not sat down and cataloged them, and to do so would necessarily take up a fair bit of time. His wife, too, is the CEO of a multi-million dollar business. I hope I have given you something of the picture. People like this do not sit around in the evenings flicking through the TV channels. They live very full and sometimes dangerous lives. But for all that, it would be hard to think of a more suitable man to be keeper of something like this. He is completely fearless, and he is very well aware of what is going on in the world behind the scenes. His friends and contacts are, too.
hell. When Christ died and the earth shook and the rocks were rent, a crack came right down the entire face of the escarpment, right past the left side of the cross hole, and the stone opened up. Down below, 20 feet below, God had arranged for the Ark of the Covenant with its mercy seat, if you please, his earthly throne, to be positioned right down there 600 years before in 586 B.C. <coughs> when the Babylonian army destroyed the city. When the centurion stuck his spear in Christ's spleen and probably left ventricle to make sure he was dead before he gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea, when he pulled that spear out, the separated platelets and serum of the blood of the Son of God gushed out, went down through that crack onto the mercy seat, and that ratified the old covenant and the new covenant. The fourth trip I made into this chamber, it was spotless. The furnishings were set in perfect order. The Ark of the Covenant, however, had been placed against the wall, the end of the cave. The end of the cave was a beautiful crystal radiating the colors of the rainbow. Now, I know New Age and all that goes in for rainbows, so do homosexuals and all of that. But God used it first, all right? It's around his throne and it's around his earthly throne. Now, there's no veil in this setup. So it is the earthly, it's God's temple on earth, or his residence where he once dwelt. And uh, anyway, when I found it like this, there were four young men standing in there. And I started to say, you know, what are you doing here? And I froze. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe, couldn't do anything. One of the people said, we are the four angels that have been taking care of the ark since Moses put the tables of stone in it, right? And they instructed me to set up my video camera with the tripod, aim it at the ark of the covenant. And they went over, lifted the mercy seat up, I don't know how heavy it is. I've never tried to lift it, but it's solid gold. And the angel said, take the tables of stone out of there. God wants everyone to see those. I took them out. All right. They put the mercy seat back down over the Ark of the Covenant. I backed away a little bit. The angel came, got the tables of stone, put them on a rock ledge inside the chamber. And I was then instructed to take a sample of the blood from the mercy seat, have that analyzed. And I did everything the angel told me to do. My question is that you said that you had the blood of our Lord examined by the Israelis. That's correct. What was their determination of that? Okay. Then... Real quickly, okay. Uh, dried blood is dead blood. Everybody knows that, all right? They can test the blood of the pharaohs, the mummies of the pharaohs, all right? There are certain things they can do they cannot get a chromosome count by any method I'm familiar with, all right? Things keep changing. I don't profess to know everything. However, there's no way I know that you can get a chromosome count out of dead blood. You can get a DNA and some other things, but not a chromosome count, all right? That's done by living white blood cells. Now then, first of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I asked one of the people I work with in, in antiquities, where is a good laboratory that does reliable work? And they said, such and such, such and such. I took it. I just said, please examine this blood and tell me what you can tell me about it. All right? They said, well, look, we're going to reconstitute it. We're going to put it in normal saline and keep it at body temperature for 72 hours with uh, gentle swirling, all right? That's their business. That's great. I said, now, I want to be there when you check it out. They said, fine. 
So I was back. They checked it out. I said, now, uh, they said it's human blood. We can tell that. They did whatever tests they need to do. And then I said, take some of the white blood cells and put them in a growth medium and keep them at body temperature for 48 hours. And they said, well, that'll do no good because it's dead blood. I said, would you please do that for me? And they said, okay, we'll do it. So anyway, I said, I want to be there when you take it out and examine it. So I was back there. They took it out, examined it under microscope, and the one technician called the other one over there, and then they called the boss over there, and they were talking Hebrew a mile a minute there for a little bit, and they looked at me and they said, Mr. Wyatt, this human blood only has 24 chromosomes in it. Everybody else has 46. You see, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, 22 autosomes from your mother, 22 autosomes from your father. You get an X from your mother, you may get an X or a Y from your father, all right? This blood had 23 chromosomes from the mother's side, one Y chromosome only. You see, the ch a child could not have developed if they hadn't had the autosomes from the mother. So all of his physical characteristics were determined by his mother's side of the family, her autosomes. His maleness was determined by this one Y that came from a source, not a human male. Then they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? I said, it's the blood of your Messiah. And I assure you, those men's lives have changed. In God's appointed time, you will be able to see the proof for yourself. Now, a lot of people who see this will, out of emotion, say, yes, he has to be telling the truth. And... I do think he is telling the truth, but to be objective about this, something that's really interesting is that he was bold enough to say this in front of a geneticist, someone who actually knows how this stuff works. This is Dr. Eugene Dunkley, a geneticist from England, and this is in 1999, that he says, I do remember that Ron was reluctant to say anything about the finding, but he felt moved during his talk at our church, having met with me earlier, to say what he had found. He knew that I would have some knowledge of the field, and if in fact he thought it was dodgy, he would not have said anything because he knew that I would be one of the few people able to pick it apart. He said in his sermon, knowing that I would understand it, and I feel to this day that God moved on him to do so, that the finding would be spoken of and would stand the test. This convinces me that Ron is right. This geneticist, after hearing Ron go through the, those details, and those details, that process of gentle swirling and reconstituting the blood or whatever he said, who's going to make that up and fool a geneticist? Now, what's also interesting, and then this is pretty much one of the last things I'm going to talk about in regards to Ron Wyatt, and then we're going to get back into the Bible. Two of people who knew Ron Wyatt, they figured out the lab where he got this tested at. And they went to that lab with a letter from that geneticist asking to see these tests. Let me read this to you. My understanding hopefully will not add to the confusion as Bill Fry and I did follow up at what we believed was the testing facility in Jerusalem around 2003. There was a particular gentleman in Jerusalem that we knew worked with Wyatt. We would not divulge his name as we do not want 10k people calling on him that provided him with information regarding a testing facility. We had come to Jerusalem with a letter from a Dr. Eugene Dunkley who was as well interested in reviewing the test results. At the facility, which shall also remain anonymous for the same reasons, we were confronted with an eerie silence. Bill and I both noticed 
from the nonverbal communication that no one dared to speak to us concerning the supposed testing. You know how when you confront your kids about something they've done, and they give you that look, guilty as charged, with not a word spoken? We knew. Someone there knew something. But nobody dared say a word. These two people who worked with Ron Wyatt closely, with a letter from the geneticist, went to this lab in Israel asking about this blood test, and they got awkward silence. Like, these people knew what they were talking about, but they weren't allowed to say anything. There's just a whole bunch of things that kind of add to the conclusion that he was probably telling the truth. I believe he was telling the truth for the most part. There's one thing that Ron Wyatt said inconsistently, and this is the one part of him where I do not believe he was being honest 100%, because if you go through his speeches and where he went to different churches and gave his talks, his story was always consistent, and that's one thing about liars, you can figure out if they're lying because their story always changes. Well, his story always stayed the same, except one particular detail. And that was, he claimed that the angels, one of the angels when they were talking to him in the fourth visit when he went, said that all of this would be revealed when the mark of the beast laws are enforced. Well, that's what he would say if you were not a Seventh-day Adventist church. If you were a Seventh-day Adventist church, he would say when the Sunday laws are enforced. Now, I had to really dig into this and find out what the angel actually said, or what he claimed the angel actually said. And on his deathbed, he was talking to a Seventh-day Adventist, and he said on his deathbed, the angel specifically said the Sunday law. Now, this is one part of Ron's testimony that I believe he was being dishonest about, because his story kept changing. If the angel told him it was the Sunday law, then why would he change basically change the word of God from that point to make it fit the mark of the beast law for other people in other churches. Because what he would say to people is that you're not ready to hear about that yet. You're not ready for that information yet. He would say that to people who are not Seventh-day Adventists. I believe his doctrine got in the way of his honesty. And I'm not sure if the angel said something about the mark of the beast. I'm not sure if he said anything about that at all. But Whatever it was, Ron Wyatt was not being 100% honest because he always changed this particular detail. And this was the only detail that he changed. And, and again, nobody's perfect. Even what I'm telling you right now, like, I could be wrong myself. But I know for a fact that Ron Wyatt would always change this particular detail. And I hold that against him because if the angel told you something specific and you tell people one thing based on what they want to hear, and then somebody else, based on what they want to hear, pandering like a politician. Because it's your denomination, you can say it now. Uh, that's just not how it works. If God tells you something, you need to say exactly how it is. And he did not do that with this particular detail. Now, everything else in his stories always matched. And I don't doubt that these things will be revealed when the mark of the beast is enforced. And that's going to be backed up by Bible, not by what Ron Wyatt says. But as far as him finding the Ark of the Covenant, I believe it. And I could be wrong, but I believe it. As far as him finding the blood of Jesus Christ and having it tested, having 24 chromosomes, I believe that too. I believe he's telling the truth. 